The title of my talk today is Help, My Baby's Eyes Are Crossed or Something. The or something refers to the myriad of ways that parents express their concerns about their baby's eye alignment or eye movement. And we hear all sorts of chief complaints. My baby has a lazy eye. The eyes are moving funny. The eyes don't move together. The eyes get stuck. The eyes are out of sync. One eye moves and the other one doesn't. The eyes move all over the place. And there's my favorite is, there's just something wrong with the eyes. And a lot of times when I'm looking at the baby in the office, they look like this. Eyes perfectly aligned, cute as a button. So the challenge is on. You know, we have vague parental complaints um, in an age group that can be very difficult to examine. And oftentimes, at first glance, a child who looks normal. So what do we do? The goals of this talk are to review the differential diagnosis of ocular misalignment in infancy, recognize signs of potential misalignment in an infant that looks normal, understand treatment options, and provide even better support for our patients. So we are going to have audience response questions as we go through the differential diagnosis. This is the first one. Do you think this baby has congenital esotropia, pseudoesotropia, third nerve palsy, or Brown syndrome? Okay, you guys are right. This is pseudoesotropia. Um, pseudoesotropia is a diagnosis of exclusion. I rule out every other thing that we're gonna go through today on the differential before I say someone ha a, a child has uh, pseudoesotropia or pseudostrabismus. The relevance of it being present after four to six months is that it helps distinguish it from ocular instability. Ocular instability should really be gone by then. It is intermittent and often improving. That's what the parents will say in the history. That helps differentiate it from infantile esotropia, which is not typically as intermittent, and you don't typically hear that it's improving. Corneal light and cover testing are normal. So you can see here the light reflexes are centered, and if I was to cover either eye, there would be no shift in the uncovered eye. The treatment is, you know, I tell parents, you know, your baby has a flat nasal bridge with this wide fold of skin. There's not as much space between the colored part of the eye and the nose, so the crossing is an illusion. And as their nasal bridge grows and their facial features grow, that fold of skin should come up and there should be more space and it should start to look less like their crossing. Um, I recommend that they follow up if the crossing gets worse or if it's not getting better in a couple of months. Anytime we talk about pseudostrabismus, the thing that we are the most concerned about is infantile esotropia. This is the baby that we just saw and this is a baby with infantile esotropia. They both have the same flat nasal bridge and the wide fold of skin. The difference is in the light reflex. As you can see, the light reflex here is clearly temporarily displaced, so the patient has a left esotropia. Infantile esotropia is more constant. Sometimes there'll be a family history. These patients often cross, fixate, and alternate, meaning that the baby will use the left eye to look in the right direction and the right eye to look in the left direction, and they should have full abduction because we want to be able to rule out a six nerve palsy, and it can be associated with latent nystagmus and vertical deviations. If amblyopia is present, patching is indicated. Otherwise, we recommend surgery after age six months or before 24 months. The reason we recommend surgery before 24 months is because we want to promote binocular fusion. All right, next audience response question. Does this baby have a fourth nerve palsy, a sixth nerve palsy, pseudostrabismus, or infantile exotropia? This baby has infantile exotropia. You can see that the eye is deviated outward. The light reflex is displaced nasally as opposed to infantile esotropia where it's displaced temporally. So infantile exotropia, the diagnosis is you should present before age one. It has a high association with neurological conditions and craniofacial syndromes. Alternate fixation is common in uh, infantile exotropia and it can be associated with um, latent nystagmus and vertical strabismus. If amblyopia is present, patching is indicated, if there's no amblyopia and you want to try to do something conservative for the strabismus, we will recommend alternate patching. If there's significant refractive errors, they should be corrected. If there's no significant refractive error and the patient has this amount of drifting out, we will consider surgery after age six months. So in this picture, please note, it's hard to see because the head is tilted and it's a picture of an older child. I had to use some pictures of older children because it's hard to get pictures of babies. So do we think this patient has no strabismus, Duane syndrome, a fourth nerve palsy, or esotropia? This baby has a fourth nerve palsy. So in this picture, it looks like the eyes are aligned. You know, the light reflexes are centered. The clue is the head tilt. 
And when you make the patient put their head in primary position, you see that the patient has a significant left hypertropia. And when they tilt the head the other way, they have a left hypertropia. So this patient has torticollis. And you will see they have a head tilt away from the affected side. So left hypertropia, right head tilt. Oftentimes, these patients will have some facial asymmetry. Kiddos with congenital fourth nerve palsies have, often have very, very good control over it. So it doesn't unmask sometimes until they get older or on eye exam. A lot of times, they will, as they get older, start complaining about vertical diplopia or reading difficulties. Vertical diplopia is always a tip for me to look for a fourth nerve palsy. If you, we recommend observation if the baby is able to control the alignment well. If there's amblyopia, patching is indicated. If there's a significant head tilt or misalignment like this patient has, we recommend surgery. Okay, does this baby have a sixth nerve palsy, esotropia, a third nerve palsy, or Brown syndrome? This child has a third nerve palsy. So when you look at the patient, you can see that the eye is exotropic, but the clue that it's not a simple exotropia is that there's ptosis. The way that you would distinguish it from congenital ptosis is that there is an exotropia. So in addition to ptosis with misalignment, there will also be limited extraocular movement. So the patient may not be able to adduct the eye, elevate the eye, or depress the eye. Third nerve palsy can also be associated with pupillary dilation. 40 to 50% of infantile third nerve palsies are congenital. They can also be associated with trauma, inflammation, and neoplasia. <coughs> Imaging is indicated if there's pupillary involvement, trauma, or if it is acute. For treatment, we recommend addressing any underlying etiology. <coughs> if there's amblyopia, patching is indicated. We recommend surgery for patients who have a congenital third nerve palsy. If there's an underlying condition, we, make, we try to observe and see if the third nerve palsy goes away as the underlying condition improves. If it doesn't, then we recommend surgery. Typically, we wait about six months. Okay, does this baby have pseudostrabismus, six nerve palsy, Brown syndrome, or exotropia? Okay. This patient has a six nerve palsy. You know, when you first look at the patient, it may look like the eyes are aligned. This is the picture I just showed you. But when you look closely, you can see there's this mild esotropia. There's some displacement of the light reflex temporally. If you were to cover the left eye, you would see a shift of the right eye outward. But the real clue is when you have, have the patient start looking to the sides. Full, full abduction and adduction here. Here there's a significant abduction deficit. So the distinguishing feature of a six nerve palsy is esotropia with an abduction deficit. Six nerve palsy can be congenital, it's due to agenesis of the nerve or nucleus. The key is esotropia present at birth and no other signs or conditions. Other etiologies that can cause a six nerve palsy are increased intracranial, pre increased intracranial pressure, microvascular causes, infections, and trauma. Treatment is like a third nerve palsy to address any underlying conditions. If amblyopia is present, patching is indicated. And for the esotropia, Surgery if it's congenital or if there's no resolution as the underlying conditions improve. Okay, does this kiddo have esotropia, exotropia, Duane syndrome, or nostrabismus? Okay, this kiddo has Duane syndrome. So when you first look at the child, the eyes are aligned. But when you have the child look to the left, you see that there's an abduction deficit again. So how do you distinguish this from a six nerve palsy? When the child looks to the right, you see there's this narrowing of the intrapapibral fissure. So patients with Duane syndrome can present with the face turn, they can present with strabismus in primary position. In addition to a unilateral abduction deficit, they can have unilateral or bilateral deficits in abduction, adduction, or both. There are several different forms of Duane syndrome. In addition to the narrowing of the interpalpebral fissure, when they abduct their eye, they can have widening of the interpalpebral fissure. The etiology is hypoplasia of the sixth nerve nucleus. The sixth nerve normally innervates the lateral rectus muscle. Um, and this lateral rectus muscle is abnormally innervated by the third nerve. These are typically non-progressive. For a patient like this with no face turn, I would just observe. Uh, if amblyopia is present, patching is indicated. If there's significant misalignment or face turn, then we recommend surgery. Here's a video of a patient with Duane syndrome. The abnormal eye is the one with the DC, which are David Coates' initials. I'd like to thank him for this video. And you can see as the kiddo looks to the left, there's an abduction deficit, and as the kid looks to the right, there's narrowing of the intrapalpebral fissure. 
abduction deficit, and then narrowing of the intral palpebral fissure. And the mom is holding the head so the child doesn't compensate by moving his head. We're just going to talk about a couple more diagnoses. This is Brown syndrome. And again, when you first look at the patient, you can see that the eyes look pretty aligned. The clue is that, and it's a little bit hard to tell in this picture, the patient has adapted a chin-up head position. Uh, and the second clue will be when you have the patient start moving their eyes. It's a little bit hard to tell in this picture, so I put this one in. This patient is trying to move this eye to the left and up. The patient's not able to elevate this eye in adduction. So Brown syndrome, chin-up position or face turn, limited elevation and adduction. And when we put this patient with the chin-up position in primary erect head position, you'll often see a hypotropia. So if amblyopia is, in, amblyopia is present, patching is indicated. If there's abnormal head position or a significant hypotropia, we recommend surgery. So Marcus Gunn jaw winking is not really a problem of alignment of the eyes. But anytime parents come in with vague complaints that there's just something wrong with my baby's eyes, um, or like there's something funny that happens when he's eating, I think of Marcus Gunn jaw winking. So you can see, as this baby's eating, that I is just doing this little winking maneuver. But at, look, you can see all these abnormal movements. So as a parent, it can be kind of hard to describe. You can see how they might say, there's just something wrong with my baby's eyes. Um, and the etiology of this is there is trigeminal and oculomotor synkinesis between the muscles of mastication and the levator, which controls the eyelid. These patients often adapt with jaw positioning. Uh, if there's amblyopia due to the ptosis, patching is indicated. For the ptosis, sometimes we need to do surgery. If the patient's unable to control the jaw wink, there's a de-innervation procedure and a sling that can be done to elevate the eye. So, <laughs> amblyopia. <laughs> Almost every single, with the exception of pseudostrabismus actually, every diagnosis that we have discussed can cause amblyopia. Amblyopia is the number one cause of vision loss in children. Early detection of amblyopia or strabismus um, can make amblyopia preventable. To frame it a different way, amblyopia is also the number one cause of monocular vision loss in adults less than age 60. So as a pediatric ophthalmologist, I feel very, very passionate about one, detection, and two, prevention of amblyopia. Just a couple words about management. So, Patching is the mainstay of amblyopia treatment, and it is not easy. I patched my own daughter. I'm deeply empathetic to patients who need, or parents who have to patch their children and to the patients. You know, and this age group is particularly challenging because you can't reason with them, and things that would work with older children, like reward charts, don't work. So you know, we have to really encourage the parents to distract the child. This is when they should be engaging, reading them stories, doing activities with them. You know, we often prescribe two hours of patching, they can break it up, do an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. Sometimes they have to build up to it, start off with 30 minutes, then an hour, and build up to the two hours. Sometimes the kid is just so obstinate, I will recommend putting socks on the arms so they get distracted and they're not ripping the patch off. And sometimes the kid's just ripping the patch off because when we patch their good eye, they can't see out of their other eye, so it's really scary to them. Um, and in some extreme cases, we recommend like the elbow splints, the ones, like the ones they use in the hospital so the kids don't rip out their IVs. Pharmacological penalization is another option. It is not optimal for all patients. For example, if you have a patient that has a very large angle esotropia where the eye is always crossed inward, the entire time it's crossed, the medial rectus is getting restricted. So a lot of times I really prefer patching because I want them to abduct the eye so that muscle is less restricted. Surgery. Parents often ask, why do we have to do, why can't we just do surgery? They look at their child and they see the eyes crossing. It is really important to optimize vision before you perform surgery. One, surgical outcomes are better if they see better. Two, part of the reason that we do surgery is to promote binocular fusion. When we patch them after surgery to treat their amblyopia, we're interrupting the fusion that we've created. And a lot of times that fusion is very tenacious and it can cause their strabismus to decompensate again. So we really have to encourage parents to bear with us. We've got to do the order correctly and improve the amblyopia first. The so reasons for surgical management are misalignment in primary position or significant abnormal head turn or head tilt. Okay, so parents' concerns about eye alignment can be vague, especially in this age group and in infancy. Detection of ocular misalignment during infancy is important for amblyopia prevention. 
Look for abnormal head position, reluctance to look in a certain direction, abnormalities with extraocular movements, eyelid changes. Referral is urgent with acute onset strabismus to rule out a sixth nerve palsy or a third nerve palsy. The mainstay of treatment is amblyopia management and surgery. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, the question was, can you please address the importance of a cover test and what we address if we don't attempt a cover test? So cover testing, a lot of times, like that patient we saw with a very subtle esotropia, if we don't do a cover test, you're going to light reflex testing with them moving, you're going to miss it. When you do the cover test and you cover the eye that the child is fixing with, the, you'll pick up the shift of the other eye that is strabismic. How do you know that amblyopia is present? So, it's tough, right? So if you are seeing a patient with infantile or esotropia, the way that you can tell is if they're only crossing one eye in. As they get a little older, obviously we do vision, and in the clinic we do teller vision acuity, but really it's if they have a strong fixation preference for an eye. So, if, or if, even if an eye is exotropic, and if you cover the um, eye that they're fixing with, and they bring the exotropic eye in, and as soon as you uncover it, the eye goes out. If they just keep preferring one eye as you check them, you know that they have amblyopia in the eye that is constantly misaligned. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.